Hi listeners, it's Kat here from Cast a Guest. I just wanted to take a quick minute outside of the show to let you know about empowerment coaching. I know this is probably confusing a lot of people right now. Outside of telling you about true crime, I work as a life coach, helping others achieve their goals, break down barriers, eliminate limiting beliefs, or anything else a person may need guidance to achieve their most authentic life. The world has been upside down since 2020, and I know a lot of us may be lost, confused, or unsure as to what we want and how to get there. If you think speaking with a life coach may help you, please feel free to contact me at alteregowellness at outlook.com or at alteregowell on Instagram. Okay, now back to our show. Hi, gentle folks. Hello. Hello. (laughs) Hello, can you hear me? Hello. You sound like a bitter Betty from the (laughs) Boulay Brothers. (laughs) I'm here for community. (laughs) And I have to say, like, Jade, I love her to bits. She's got to put her best foot forward. She has to put her best But you know what? I'm I'm a bad bitch. I got real boobs, and I'm going out there, and I'm going to blow them away. You guys have to watch season four of Boulay Brothers on Prime. Uh, Oh, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, what what do we got for you today? What do we got? Other than murder, mayhem, rape, and motherfucking shit. We got today, Scotland. T-Boys. That's T with a T. German wine. And Mein Kampf. If you're thinking, none of those things have anything in common. (laughs) Well, you're wrong. You German know what? wine and mine comes maybe. But not with the other. You're wrecking the joke. <laughs> you're wrecking the joke. If you're thinking Billy Connolly has a new special where he talks about controversial shit from the 40s. No. But we love Billy Connolly. Is he still doing stuff but Billy Connolly? No, there's, there's, now is not the time for a conversation. <laughs> now is not the time for a digression. Today we're talking about Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, a pair of fucking bastards, and their murder-rape spree in Scotland in the 60s. This is going to suck, but they always do. So grab yourself something brown, cold, and alcoholic, and let's get through with this. I'm John. And I'm Kat. And this is Castagast. everyone hi there folks mm. Mm. you feel that mm. that tastes like Ew. that smells like <sighs> that sounds like murder i'd like to point out that john is not in a good mood today no i'm not in a good mood i fucking work for a municipality and fuck <laughs> being a city worker sucks working for jackasses that's all i fucking do my bosses are jackasses their bosses are councilmen are jackasses just a bunch of fucking jackasses. So I guess I struck a nerve there, did I? I was I was just forgetting how much I hate <laughs> my life, aside from you, <laughs> in this fucking podcast. You don't hate this podcast. Get out of here. I said I didn't. I said aside from. Oh. God, use your fucking ears. You can't read. You can't fucking... Jesus Why don't Christ. you give us our disclaimer? Oh, uh, already? Listen, folks. I don't know about you, but when bad things happen in my life, or I hear things that are disturbing or that are upsetting, um, I get pissed off and I dwell about it and I, I get really angry and I stew and I have arguments with invisible people in the shower. Your shampoo bottles yep. cheer you on. Yeah, they do. We don't want to do that here at Castagast. We're talking about horrible shit that should, and rightly so, wreck your entire day when you hear about it uh so we try and keep things as light as possible we make fun of the murderers the rapists we make fun of their families who you know created these assholes and we make fun of the people like dumbass police officers 
or uh, stupid botched reporters, botched people who just make the entire situation worse than it has to be. So, if that's not the kind of true crime podcast you're looking for, well, I got to tell you, we're not necessarily true crime. We actually talk about other stuff. Just we've been talking about true crime a lot lately. So, <laughs> so if you want to listen to this sort of thing, fuck yeah, sit back, relax. And other idioms that people overuse <laughs> and drink up. And I'll let you know when to take the shots. Mm-hmm. Let's get into this motherfucker. Let's get on with the goddamn show. I would just like to point out real quick for those, since we are a podcast and you cannot see us, I would just like to point out the irony that we're talking true crime and I'm sitting next to John who's wearing a wife beater right now while he's mm-hmm. drinking liquor. <laughs> I don't know why they call it a wife beater. Yeah, that we should. I I would love to know a statistic of how many uh, wife beaters wear white undershirts. I wonder if that like uh, if like once upon a time in the forties and fifties and stuff, it's just like every male mugshot was just them in a in a white undershirt. <laughs> when I was in grade eight. Oh my god! And, here we go. And the movie Pitch Black came out. And Vin Diesel was younger at the time, and he was fucking huge. He got a little bit soft in, like, one of the uh, Fast and Furious videos, and he bulked up again so he could mm-hmm. face the rock. Mm-hmm. But back in grade 8 in 2004, holy fuck, he was badass in Pitch Black, and he wore, like, a black... You weren't in grade 8 in 2004. 2003, 2004. Shut up. We were in high school by that time. We, we were, were also grade in Grade 8 was 2001. Th- Oh, yeah, yeah, 2001, 2001, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get on with uh, this. Anyways, fucking Vin <laughs> Diesel was in pitch black, and the entire time he was wearing a black wife beater, and I was like, that's the coolest fucking look, and I wanted to go to school. I was working out at the time, but you can only get so big as a fucking grade eight, and I wanted to so bad just walk around. And I love Duke Nukem as well. So all I wanted to do was go to school wearing black and red wife beaters. And the teacher was like, you can't wear wife beaters. Like they were, it was a fucking Catholic it school. school code. It, it was, yeah. a, it was a Catholic school. Dress code. And so from then on, like I have names for different kinds of beaters. So like a white undershirt is a, is a wife beater, obviously. A black wife beater is a diesel beater. Oh my God. And a red wife beater is a Nukem beater. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Yeah. So spread the word. Yeah. (laughs) I know we posted a picture of us um, when we hit our 200 followers, but it was strongly filtered. So just picture... (laughs) We're not actually white. (laughs) Or have skeleton faces. Um, We're bald. So just picture a, a very muscular German man with a Peaky Blinders haircut wearing a wife beater. And that is the prize that i have sitting next to me all right let's get on with the goddamn show okay. enough of this shit who fucking goes on tangents like this on true crime okay myra henley was born july 23rd 1942 in manchester england to parents nelly and bob henley the family lived in a working class area that was overcome by victorian slum housing her father bob was an abusive alcoholic and was often violent towards his wife nelly and the kids Due to the condition and size of the home, Myra had to sleep in a bed that was right next to her parents' double bed. Oh, that sucks. That would be awful. The living conditions worsened when Myra's little sister was born in 1946. A year later, Myra was sent to live with her grandmother. Myra's father served in the Second World War and was known to be a tough man while in the army. He expected his children to be the same way and taught them to fight back and stick up for themselves. When Myra was eight, a boy scratched her cheek and drew blood. When she ran home crying to her father, he threatened to leather her if she didn't fight back. Wow. (laughs) Shit. (laughs) She left the home, found the boy, and attacked him with a series of punches. She later wrote, quote, at eight years old, I scored my first victory, end quote. Oh, I have really conflicted feelings about this. I I think, like, I I don't know where this is going to go. Yes. But I think, like, that was badass. You you don't threaten your kid. Mm Mm-hmm. But I think that was a good life lesson. I think like, it is and, and what a And what a fucking push for female and male equality. There you go. You know, that boy fucking scratched you like a little piece of shit. You go over there and beat the fuck out of him. Yeah, I agree. I don't care if you're a tiny little girl. You go and fucking throw punches. <laughs> 
Ian Brady was born in Glasgow, Scotland on January 2nd, 1938 to mother Margaret Peggy Stewart. Is Peggy short for something? Oh, that's a good question. It's like Pegatrude. (laughs) Peggy was an unmarried waitress and the identity of Ian's biological father was never proved. Peggy said he was a reporter for the Glasgow newspaper and died three months before Ian's birth. Sadly, not having much financial support, Peggy was forced to give Ian up to the care of Mary and John Sloan, a couple who had four children of their own. Ian took that family name and became Ian Sloan. Peggy frequently visited Ian as a child while he was with the Sloans. There were allegations that he would torture animals as a child, but Ian would always deny this. As a child, Ian was accepted into Shawlands Academy, a school for above-average students. Oh, God damn it. However... We we got, like, a smart animal torturer. (laughs) And I just... A lot of that... Remember we discussed this in one of our podcasts about a lot of, like, killers being, like, highly intelligent human beings? Yeah, I was always, like wary of those fuckers that got 85 percent and above you were that you were that person no no (laughs) however his behavior worsened as he attended shawlands as a teenager he appeared twice in juvenile court for housebreaking he left shawlands by 16 years old and got a job as a t-boy at the harland and wolf shipyard a t-boy is literally the person who makes tea for the workers no shit (laughs) he left nine months later and became a butcher boy he did have a girlfriend named... <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if, like, in a butcher boy is someone who makes butchers for the workers? <laughs> he did have a girlfriend named Evelyn, but they broke up after he threatened her with a knife for attending a dance with another boy. He got into further trouble and it ended up in court again with nine charges, not quite 17 years old yet. Nine charges? What were the charges? Like, dickery, buggery? Like, this is yeah, England, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, This is Scotland. (laughs) The judge placed him on a probation with the condition that he lived with his mother, Peggy, who now lived in Manchester with her husband, Patrick Brady. Ian went to live with them, got a job at Patrick's work as a fruit porter, and took his last name, Brady. Fruit, fruit, where, where are we? Fruit porter. What is a fruit porter? Well, he ports fruit. For the next couple of years, he would continue to get in and out of trouble with the law. Finally, in 1959, around 20 or 21 years old, he got a clerical job at Millward's, a chemical wholesale distribution company. January 1961, Myra, who is now 18 years old, was hired at Millward's as a typist. It was at Millward's where she met Ian. She was completely infatuated by him, despite knowing his criminal record. She likes the bad boys. She likes the bad boys. Mm. She would detail her infatuation in her diary for months, but it wasn't until July that she finally spoke to him for the first time. Oh, it's kind of like us. Yes. You just stared at me You writing in into your journal about your infatuation with me? No, no, no. Don't talk about the diary. (laughs) In December, Ian finally asked her on a date, and the two quickly fell into a romantic routine together. (laughs) They would go to I love our romantic routine. <laughs> we do it over and over and over again because it's a routine. <laughs> they would go to the movies watching mostly X-rated films. What? How romantic. <laughs> Let's see some bush and then go for a makeout. Then they would go back to Myra's house to drink German wine. <laughs> Oh my god, what is this kind of dating? <laughs> and it's in 61, so yeah. do you like Big Bush on a <laughs> grainy fucking screen? And, and German do you wine? Like, and do you like wine that tastes like fucking socks. grape juice and socks? <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's what I like, yeah. <laughs> they would read to each other during their lunch break. We actually like German wine. <laughs> yeah, and we, we like all wine, yeah. We like a good ravener. <laughs> Ian liked books on Nazi atrocities and Mein Kampf. Myra bleached her hair blonde and would wear thick red lipstick, wanting to emulate the Aaron perfection. Jesus, that's a bit too close. Like, people are going to know what you're doing. Yeah. What are you doing here? She started dressing a little more risque as well, wearing leather jackets, short skirts, and high boots. They would frequent the library a lot, checking out books on philosophy, crime, and torture. Yeah, they're all in the same section. They w- <laughs> they did fantasize about robbing banks and even purchase guns, but their plans never resulted in any follow-through. 
lame. I, I get that though. You like you think of projects and you never you never complete <laughs> that get, any of them. Get rich quick scheme. Yeah, you get started, but you never you never get. Da Vinci had the same issue. He wanted to rob banks as well, but he was too busy trying to make a time machine and a flying machine that never worked. In June of 1963, Ian moved in with Myra and her grandmother. And on June 12, 1963, the couple committed their first murder together. They borrowed a van which Myra drove and Ian followed with his motorcycle. If he spotted a potential victim, he would signal with his headlight. As they were driving down Froxmer Street, Ian saw a 16-year-old Pauline Reed, a classmate of Myra's younger sister. She was on her way to a disco dance. Myra offered her a ride, which Pauline accepted. Once inside, Myra gave a story about needing help with a lost expensive glove. Pauline agreed to help her look for it. Myra took her to the Saddleworth Moor. Once there, Ian showed up and took Pauline. According to Myra, Ian returned about 30 minutes later and took Myra to Pauline's dying body. She had nearly been decapitated by two cuts on the throat, one being a four-inch cut across her voice box. It was done with such force that her coat collar and necklace had been pushed inside her neck and her spinal cord had been severed. Holy fuck. Ian buried the body at the moor. However, Ian's account stated that Myra was there for the whole attack and even participated in the sexual assault. Jeez, that poor girl. Their next murder would take place on November 23rd of 1963, just months after Pauline. 12-year-old John Kilbride was at a market in Ashton Underline, trying to earn some pocket money. After loading some boxes into Myra and Ian's car, the couple offered him a ride home, under the guise that his parents must be worried with him being out so late. They also promised him a bottle of sherry. Once he was inside the car, they would use the same lost glove excuse and took him to the moor. Once there, Ian sexually assaulted 12-year-old John. Jeez, so boys and girls. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. Afterwards, he tried slitting his throat with a six-inch serrated knife, but was unsuccessful. He ended up strangling him with a shoelace or a string-like ligature. A search took place for John, and over 500 missing posters were printed for him, but nothing would turn up until two years later. Wow. On June 16, 1964, 12-year-old Keith Bennett had disappeared while on his way home from his grandmother's house. The couple offered him a ride and took him to the moor. According to Myra, Ian had sexually assaulted him, then strangled him. On December 26, 1964, Myra and Ian would take their youngest victim, Leslie Ann Downey, who was 10 years old. Oh no, fucking god damn it. Myra and Ian were at the fun fair in Ancoats, where they noticed Leslie. When they approached her, they purposely dropped shopping bags they were carrying and asked for her help to take them back to her to their car. They took her back to Myra's house where she was raped and tortured and had explicit photos taken of her. Oh Jesus, yeah. fuck. She was also strangled. The couple recorded on audio her final moments, which was later played in court. She was taken to the moor, and they buried her naked body in a shallow grave. Jesus fucking Christ. Please tell me that the fucking audio is not available. I did not even check for that, but we will get into more of the audio, oh, sadly. God damn it. Yeah. You always say you're going to tell us when shots are taken, but you never tell us when shots are taken. Guys, shots are taken. Yeah, we had to drink for that one. Drink. Drink up. In the evening of October 6, 1965, Myra and Ian were scouting for their next victim at the Manchester Railway Station. Myra waited in the car while Ian was out searching. After a few minutes, he came back with 17-year-old Edward Evans, who he found at a gay bar. Ian introduced Myra as his sister. They went back to their home to have some wine. After a while, by Ian's instruction, Myra called her brother-in-law, David Smith, and asked him to come over. When he got there, Ian greeted him in the kitchen and asked him if he was there for the, quote, miniature wine bottles, end quote. Ian left David in the kitchen, saying he was going to get the wine bottles. A moment later, David heard a very loud screaming, saying, quote, It sounded like a woman, really high-pitched. Then the screams carried on, one after another, really loud. Then I heard Myra shout, Dave, help him, very loud. When I ran in, I just stood inside the living room and I saw a young lad. 
He was lying with his head and shoulders on the couch and his legs were on the floor. He was facing upwards. Ian was standing over him, facing him, with his legs on either side of the young lad's legs. The lad was still screaming. Ian had a hatchet in his hand. He was holding it above his head and he hit the lad on the left side of his head with the hatchet. I heard the blow. It was a terrible, hard blow. It sounded horrible. End quote. Holy fuck. Jesus. David then saw Ian strangle Edward with an electrical cord. David and Ian wrapped the body in plastic and put it in the spare bedroom. David said he would come back the next day with the baby stroller to use for transporting the body to the car so they could take it to the moor. When he got home at 3 a.m., however, he vomited and told his wife, Myra's sister, everything. He stayed up, armed with a screwdriver and a knife, in case Ian came for him. David then called the police, went to the station, and told the officers everything he witnessed the night before. Oh, no kidding. What a... Yeah. Good, he, good for he him. He totally used his survival tactics of yeah. like, yes, I'll come back, I'll help you, and then was like, no. No, good. Bob Talbot of the Staley Bridge Police Station and a detective sergeant went to Ian and Myra's home that day. Bob was wearing a bread delivery man's overalls. When Myra answered, they asked for her husband. She denied having a husband or that any man lived in the home. Bob then identified himself as a superintendent. Maya invited him into the house and led him into the living room where Ian was laying on a divan. A A divan. A divan. Please say it properly. (laughs) The detectives said they were investigating an act of violence involving guns from the night before. Myra denied that anything happened and allowed the police to look around the house. When they got to the locked spare bedroom, they asked for the key. Myra said she left it at her workplace. When they offered to take her to go get it, Ian told her to hand it over. They discovered Edward Evans and arrested Ian on suspicion of murder. When Ian was being arrested, he said, quote, Eddie and I had a row, and the situation got out of hand, end quote. Myra was arrested on October 11th and was charged with accessory to murder. When searching their home, investigators found an exercise book with John Kilbride's name inside of it, the 12-year-old. They now suspected Myra and Ian for his disappearance and then the disappearances of the other children. The officers found a luggage claim ticket in Myra's prayer book, When they went to the Manchester station and retrieved the left luggage, they found an assortment of costumes, notes, photographs, and photograph negatives. These photographs also contained the once-taken photos of 10-year-old Leslie Downey. Oh, my God. The photo was of her naked body with a scarf tied in her mouth. Oh, Jesus Christ. They also found the audio recording of her. It contained... A recording of her screaming, crying, and begging to be returned to her mother. Oh, my God. Holy fuck. Just 10 years old. Jesus like, Christ. Oh, my God. Officers then spoke to neighbors. After speaking to 12-year-old Patricia Hodges, who hung out with Myra and Ian at the moor before, she told them about their favorite spot there. Police immediately went there and began their search. On October 16th, they found an arm protruding from the dirt. It was identified as Leslie's. Oh, my God. On October 21st, they found the decomposed body of John Kilbride. Myra and Ian were charged with the deaths of Edward Evans, John Kilbride, and Leslie Downey. Twelve-year-old Keith Bennett's remains were never found, so they could not charge them for his death. They both pled not guilty. After a 14-day trial and two hours of deliberation, a jury found Ian Brady guilty for all three murders and Myra guilty of Leslie Downey's and Edward Evans' murder. Ian Brady was sentenced to three life sentences and Myra was given two life sentences. Investigators believe they are linked to other missing children and teenager cases. Malcolm McCulloch, professor of forensic psychiatry at Cardiff University, has said that Myra's relationship with her father brutalized her. She was not only used to violence in the home, but rewarded for it outside. When this happens at a young age, it can distort a person's reaction to such situations for life. In 1987, Myra took the media by storm by releasing a full confession and admitted her involvement in all five murders. All of her chances at parole were denied, and she died of respiratory failure in 2002 at the age of 60. Good. 
Ian Brady died on May 15, 2017, at the age of 79. His cause of death was listed as natural causes. His wish was to have his ashes scattered at his favorite place, the Saddleworth Moor. Oh, that disgusting fuck. The same place where he killed and buried his victims, but a judge ordered a ban on this, and his final wish was not granted. Good. I hope they flushed him down the toilet. 16-year-old Pauline Reed is now buried at Gorton Cemetery. John Kilbride is now resting at Hearst Cemetery in ashton under Sadly, as I stated before, Keith Bennett's remains have never been found. Leslie Downey and Edward Evans are both buried in the Southern Cemetery. Jeez. So that concludes our story on Myra Hindley and Ian Brady. And these were these fucks? That's them. Jesus Christ. They Do they not look like... And that was David Smith. So that's the one that like went along with it just... You know, to live yeah. through the night, and that was Myra's sister. Wow! Like he's like badass looking. He if is, you ask me, he is badass. But like. um, like, do they not just look like a Bonnie and Clyde? I was about to say they. The whole story or reminds like John me John Dillinger. You yeah. know, like and maybe that was just the time, but yeah, they seem like a Bonnie and Clyde. Their story feels like a Paul Bernardo and Carla Carla oh. Homoka. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They are they they are hideous looking intense fuckers. They're intense looking like those mug shots, they that they look like they belong in like a Tim Burden fucking movie. That's oh my gosh, you nailed it by saying that. Cause they I hate to say this, but they're attractive looking people. And I can see why poor children fell victim to them. Yeah, no. Because kidding. they look like you're your average, especially when we look in this photo, and I know you guys can't see us, but we will be posting these on our socials. But um, this one picture in particular where he has his arm around her and she's in the checkered skirt, they look like a harmless couple where, like, yes, of course tw- a 12-year-old would, especially in that time where, you know, they would be trusted. I'm just, I'm just like, looking at that picture and thinking... Were, were they posing that or were they just getting up or or were they fighting gravity at that moment? Like it was, it's such a stupid pose for a picture. So I will say, too, she had a dog, a Jack Russell. Oh, fuck. I kept I kept this out, but I, I'm well, adding it Well, now we're adding it in. <laughs> so she had a dog, a Jack Russell. I believe it was a Jack Russell that she was absolutely obsessed with. Yeah. And there's actually photos of her at the moor that was actually like one of the grave sites. So they went back to visit these places and like took smiley pictures oh, of them fuckers. at these grave sites. And one of them in particular is her holding her dog, who she was obsessed with, smiling. And I believe she was standing over the grave of John Kilbride, if my memory serves me right from my research. And the police took her dog um, and it mysteriously died. Oh, really? When they seized her dog while they arrested her. And she she firmly said like firmly believes they murdered her dog. Hmm. So I don't know like. I don't agree with taking it out on the course, dog. Oh no, God! It'd be, of course it'd be, not. It'd be nice if they just gave it away to someone. Yeah. Just take away something that she was absolutely. It's like taking away Amber Heard's dogs because she tried to get them into Australia. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Stupid fucking cunt. I know. Justice for Johnny. <laughs> Justice for Johnny, everyone. <laughs> Hashtag. Hashtag. Anyways, we're not here to talk about Amber Heard and Johnny no. Depp. I wanted to wrap up the case um, with the final resting spots of the victims, and um, if anyone should find themselves in the area, I I know I personally would love to visit their final resting spots and oh we would love to visit uh, the british isles anyways mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all right we're done talking with this get dylan mcdermott up oh yes get him up get him up here we go all right everyone everyone <laughs> oh and also oh for f- <laughs> fuck once we eventually run out of the great Dylan McDermott quotes, if you guys... Oh, we'll never run out. Look along the pages. If you guys have any suggestions on other actors we should close our show out with, please drop it in our comments. It can't be It can't be like mainstream Hollywood stars. Mm-hmm. No, I want, I want like Ernest Borgnine. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I want Bobcat... Like, <laughs> what was that guy's Gold, name? Bobcat Goldway. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's a dog. It's a dog, you <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> Wait, that wasn't Bob. No, no, I that know. Was, I was, was just doing. I was doing Scrooge. <laughs> we were doing Scrooge. If you it's haven't seen a Scrooge, bone. <laughs> it's a bone, you lucky dog. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh goodness. Alright. Alright. Listen, listen. To the listen to the words, the words. Let's listen to the words, the words. Remember from the uh worth a worth a buy guy? The oh, the yeah, best yeah, yeah. video game reviewer on the internet, the worth a buy. Mm-hmm. Guy he's also Scottish. Let's listen to the words, the words. Of Daily McDermott. I did a movie with Clint Eastwood, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to outman him. <laughs> How true. I don't Truer think, words have never been spoken. There are very few men who could outman Clint Eastwood. You know, I gotta say, though, all this talk about Dirty Harry, and after we finally watched it, he's a terrible shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that first and part where he shoots him. You know, like he's eating a sandwich and he's like halt and like pieces of sandwich are coming out of his face and he blows a guy away. Oh my <laughs> but he, gosh. But he used all six bullets, like all six shots. You gotta ask yourself one question. That's more like Duke Nukem. I don't yeah. know what I'm doing. Anyways. Thank you very much for listening or watching or both. And we hope you have a lovely week. Take care. Be kind to one another. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> Sorry, I'm do just, better. I'm <laughs> qu- I'm quoting Ellen. Oh, uh, just fucking have a good time, and if it's not, eat, drink, yeah. and be merry. Yeah, yeah. If it's not good enough, drinking will get better. Do a Goldie Hawn. Do a Goldie Hawn. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Bye, folks. Goodbye. Ta ta. You can check us out on YouTube at Catum Concoction. That's C A T A M C. O N C O C T I O N. (laughs) (laughs) And on Instagram at cast underscore aghast. Remember, there's a silent H. Myra Henley was born... I have a bubble in my throat. Is it Myra or is it Mira? Myra's father... Myra! (laughs) Myra! Myra's father... (laughs) Hook references. We make them all the time. Yeah. Dustin Hoffman. Do I need... But I... I, Oh, yeah, your breath stinks. (laughs) But... (laughs) Pagonalanala? Peggy. I know a woman at my work, we and, are... and her name is not Peggy. It's not even close to Peggy. Her actual name doesn't even start with P, but she goes by Peggy. It's just like it confuses the fuck out of me. Can we cut that out entirely? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to have to get a whole new microphone. You guys, he is horrific to me. Don't ever get married. Don't let people talk you into getting married. <laughs> These rings are handcuffs. <laughs> Peggy was unmarried. Don't worry, we're going to fuck later. <laughs> And on July 12, 1963, the couple committed their first murder together. Committed, the, committed their first murder. While they were driving down Foxmer Street, Ian... S- Froxmer. Myra took her to the Saddleworth Moor. Uh, <laughs> the Saddleworth Moor, please. In the evening of October 6, 1965... Are you going to sniffle right in the mic? <laughs> yeah, in- well, you burp into the mic. <laughs>